All right, welcome back. Our next panel is called Masterclass, a winning playbook for litigating against the SEC. So this completes the three-part masterclass. We had the investigation, we had the how not to get sued, and now I guess you've been sued, how, how to uh, put the winning playbook together. So let me quickly introduce our panel. Uh, starting with uh, Olivia Cho from the SEC. She's Chief Litigation Counsel at the agency. Before joining the SEC, Olivia was a federal prosecutor in the Southern District of Florida. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you for joining us. Sarah Heaton Concanon, a partner at Quinn Emanuel, where she serves as co-chair of the firm's enforcement defense practice. And Sarah recently served as senior trial counsel at the SEC where she was undefeated in dispositive motions at trial and on appeal. Sarah, welcome. Um, Please welcome Claudius Modesti, a partner at Aiken Gump in Washington, DC. Claudius has a wide array of government and public service experience, having served as an SEC enforcement attorney, a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of Virginia, and of course, the first ever director of the Division of Enforcement at the PCO, PCAOB. Welcome, Claudius. Uh, also, uh, very pleased to welcome back Matt Solomon, a partner at Cleary in D.C. Matt joined that firm after serving for 15 years as a white-collar prosecutor and unit chief with the DOJ, and also as a senior enforcement official with the SEC, most recently as the SEC's chief litigation counsel. Uh, finally, uh, pleased to welcome our moderator, Terrence Healy. He's a partner at Hughes, Hubbard, and Reed, where he's chair of the securities enforcement practice and co-chair of the private funds practice. Previously, Terrence was Senior Assistant Chief Litigation Counsel for the Division of Enforcement. Terrence, let me turn it over to you. Uh, Great, thanks, Bruce. So there's a lot of discussion at conferences like this about how to conduct investigations, how to interact with the staff, the Wells process, and all those things about you do not to get charged. So this is not this this panel. This is, we've been charged and we're gonna fight. So this is for people who didn't take the master class on how not to get charged. (laughs) And looking looking at a case from a completely different perspective. So we're gonna talk today about when we have a case we're litigating against the SEC, and what do we do in terms of tactics, approaches, how do we do things differently, how do we evaluate cases, and how do we put the client in the best position to to win the case or get the, the best outcome. But and before we uh, start talking about all the ways to beat Olivia's army of uh, trial attorneys across the country, I thought it'd be helpful if maybe Olivia, we can start with just getting an overview of the litigation program at the SEC for benefit of many in the audience who don't have as much experience. Describe for us you know, how the, uh, the function works, what your job role is as chief litigation counsel, how the trial unit is structured, and how the various, you know, uh, litigation functions, not just out of D.C. and New York, but also from the various regional offices work? Sure. So we have um, a nationwide trial program. We have several dozen uh, trial attorneys within the Division of Enforcement. Our trial attorneys are actually uh, divided into two broader groups. The core group is who many of you interact with. Um, our core attorneys, several dozen litigate cases from filing through remedies, uh, including trials. Um, We have a smaller group of more specialized attorneys who deal with matters that are in the collections phase, once we have been awarded a uh, monetary remedy, um, deal with distributions to harmed investors, um, deal with um, matters involving bankruptcy issues for entities who may be in bankruptcy in uh, the investigative stage or in litigation as well as receiverships um, when they are a part of our litigation um, and appointed by the court. Um, our core attorneys and our, um, and our more specialized attorneys are um, spread across all of our offices. Obviously, the largest group is in the home office, um, but we do have trial attorneys even in our, our small offices. All of our attorneys really do litigate nationwide. We bring uh, cases in district courts across the country. Um, I think technically each of our regional offices has a certain area that they cover, but you know we have trial attorneys in LA who are litigating uh, you know a case in the Northern District of Texas. We have trial attorneys in Fort Worth who have a case pending in the Southern District of New York. Um, we've had trial attorneys in the DC office litigate cases uh, in Arkansas. So it's really um, it's really a nationwide program. 
Um, our core trial attorneys are largely generalists. Um, of course, as all of you know, you become a specialist on any case you're on, but we are, um, for the most part, generalists. As my colleague Dave Hirsch mentioned earlier today, uh, we are, with the expansion of the crypto asset and cyber unit, dedicating a certain number of trial attorney positions to those types of matters, um, which, as he pointed out, you know, and I think makes a lot of sense, um, given the technical complexity and novelty. I'm going to stop myself and give my disclaimer here. <laughs> All of my remarks today are, uh, of course, reflect my views and do not necessarily reflect those of the commission, the commissioners, or other commission staff. Obviously, I am uh, relatively new in this role, so that didn't automatically come out of my mouth as soon as I uh, got up here. Um, but that, that's kind of the overall structure, and our trial attorneys, as you all know, get involved at various points in the investigation um, and to varying extents. So I, I think uh, the defense bar and the people in this room uh, maybe have noticed in the current administration at the ICC has certainly been uh, firm in its settlement positions, and more cases are, are going to litigation. We can see the numbers. Uh, there's been a number of trials in, in recent years. How did the last fiscal year stack up in terms of your trial record? Um, the last fiscal year, fiscal year 2022, was um, very active as far as trials. I think partly that was a lot of courts becoming more active in their dockets. We had 15 trials. They were all in district court, 14 of them jury trials. One of them was a bench trial. Um, we, we did um, quite well in the trials overall, consistent with, in general, our record over the last several years. Um, but out of the 15 trials, we got 13 favorable verdicts. The stats get a little funky because one of those verdicts was uh, vacated shortly after trial because the court had um, not pulled the jury at the request of the defense. So that was vacated. It's on interlocutory appeal. Um, so you can count it as 13 out of 15 or 12 out of 14, but overall um, quite a successful year. So 13 and 2. Correct. Okay. I think that's fair. Well, and, so and the, can I dig into that stat a little bit? So one of the things I've been curious about is some of the press releases on the trial victories that suggest, reading between the lines, that a case may have gone to trial as a scienter-based fraud and ultimately had a jury verdict on negligence-based fraud. Um, is that included as part of your, your win stats on that 85%? That would be included. When we win on a claim against a party, it's counted as a win. I don't think that's uncommon. Um, in the way probably any party counts uh, a, a case that goes to trial or across the government. Um, we do count that as a win, and I think um, for, a, for a party that's found liable, whether it's on all of the claims that are brought against them or you know, a subset of those claims, um, it counts to have the SEC prevail at trial and pursue its remedies. Now, you maybe could have spared the entire litigation and process itself if uh, there could have been an offer of a negligence-based Resolution, but every case is every case is different. So now we move on to the, the the main reason for the panel. How are we going to put more more losses on Olivia's record <laughs> next year? And of course, you know we all want to try. We all want to litigate cases. We want to try the cases, and you have to have that kind of magic combination of the indemnified individual or high net worth individual or you know a asset managers or, or small companies in a kind of bet the company situation. Um, we can talk about you know. When do you have the willingness to, to litigate? When does the client have the willingness to actually litigate against the government? We've been in situations, all of us in this room, where board, publicly traded companies, the board tells the general counsel, this will not be on the, the K next year. I don't care, get it, get it done. But oftentimes, it seems that settlement positions really, or whether we're going to litigate is driven by the SEC, where they ask for a you know, billion dollars in lifetime bars and you know, your firstborn child. But one interesting thing I'd like to hear uh, this group talk about is when do you, do you decide early in a case whether this is a case where we're going to litigate to get a better settlement resolution, or are we looking at this as going to trial? And when do you make that decision? I see you, you're nodding your head, Matt. Uh, do you evaluate early in a, in a case about what the end game is going to be, whether this is gonna, we're going to be in a courtroom, or look for some earlier off-ramp? 
Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it depends, as you said, on the client, obviously. If you're representing you know, a global financial institution, it's not that they can't fight. Um, some have. They won't, right. Some have, but, it, but it's going to be very few and far between. So you certainly want to build up your arguments as best you can on litigation risk and hope those get heard. And you want to plan for the possibility that a case could litigate, because I think there are some registrants who have proven themselves willing to litigate and may be willing to litigate under the right circumstances. Um, but if you have an individual, um, or you have, as you said, a private company, or a company you know, like an AT&T, for example, that's fighting in the Reg FD case, or Rio Tinto that's fighting the SEC, or Vale. My firm is representing Vale, and, 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 and we're fighting in that case, too. Um, if you have a client that, that temperamentally um, can withstand, you think, a war complaint, you got to think about what's that complaint going to say, what's the worst it could say, and could this company withstand that. If you get a sense that's a possibility, I think you do be, pre begin preparing early in the investigative process for that, always with a mind towards cooperating, always with a mind towards trying to achieve a reasonable settlement. But uh, I think if you know you may be in a situation where the client's willing to take that risk, um, I think it's always something you've got to have in the back of your mind and begin building a record from very early on in your investigation. Yeah, in the Rio Tinto ex uh, example, for one, at least so far in the process, there's been uh, some success or some gain, and not some gain so far, it seems, um, from the defense perspective there. When we evaluate whether to whether a case is one that we're going to be able to resolve or go to trial, we've had the experience where early in the, investi in the investigation phase, even early investigation phase, suddenly trial attorneys are involved, actively involved in the investigation, taking testimony. And as a defense bar, we kind of look at that and say, huh, that's not good. And the client asks, you know, what does it mean? And we tell them, ah, oh, it doesn't mean anything. But you sort of think that the commission is looking at this case differently. And when you have a high profile uh, company, uh, company or a potential defendant and, um, you know, a case that's going to generate a good press release, sometimes you get a sense there's an incentive uh, from the staff to want to litigate the case, want to, want to bring charges. So uh, maybe I'll ask you, Sarah, from your time on the staff, since you know, what does it mean when we see trial attorneys involved early in the investigation phase at all, but really early investigation phase? And how concerned should we be? So I'm not going to say it depends on the facts and circumstances, because I feel like that should be a drinking game for this today. Um, but I will say it depends, so I'll give you the lawyer answer. Um, and of course, speaking through the lens of my personal experience. But I feel like there are really three different reasons why you might see trial counsel appear in a case early. And that means in explaining to your client, what do I read from this, there are three potentially very different answers to that question. Um, one is can simply be that certain of the senior officers at the commission have a real preference for having invest or trial unit attorneys involved in their investigation in early stages. They see the benefits of having someone um, with cross-border experience or with experience navigate, navigating thorny privilege issues real-time in testimony. If you're not involved in the investigation on the front end, you can't contribute in a meaningful way as trial counsel to the ongoing investigation. So there are often just relationships between particular trial counsel and particular SOs where they will bring them in early so that they can have the benefit of their expertise going forward. Um, I would say in my own experience, that was a considerable portion of the cases where I was involved early on. Um, and also, I, you know, I describe my own practice as I like to meddle in interesting things. So 90% of the work of the commission happens on the investigative side an opportunity as a trial lawyer to have a bigger influence on the trajectory of the case. The other two instances are probably of more interest to clients, which are it's a really strong case or it's a really weak case. Um, but it could be in either of those buckets. Um, if it's a very strong, high-profile case where the commission knows that there is going to be a charging recommendation and that is, it's just a case of significance, you very well can see a trial attorney involved early on, again, to build the best evidentiary record, uh, create the strongest case possible, and put that forward. The flip side is you will also see trial counsel early on often 
where there's some weakness in the case, and the idea is that trial counsel can come in and try to fill the gaps. So, you know, perhaps there's an element issue. So we're going to have difficulty proving scienter. You, you well, made, me, made me smile, by the way, when you said there may be weakness in the case. Like, <laughs> Yeah, we notice that sometimes in SEC cases, there's, there's yeah. entity. But a sur surmountable weakness. So I'll put on my SEC hat and I'll say the reason why you bring in trial counsel is to say, we recognize there might be an issue with scienter. We recognize there might be an issue with materiality. There may be a hugely problematic cooperator who is going to be the core of our case at trial. Let's get trial counsel in so that they can start looking at those potential issues and figuring out ways to redress them early instead of on the eve of trial where suddenly you're trying to put together a charging document and for the first time somebody's looking at the file saying, you know, I, I have significant concerns about the credibility of the key witness. How are we, how are we going to deal with this problem? I'll I'll just jump in and add, I mean, we put our resources where it makes sense, and that includes our trial resources. So you will see trial attorneys involved. And I would just say, as far as um, you know, speaking to your clients, um, trying to parse the tea leaves beyond, this is a litigator who's going to be looking at the evidence and the witnesses with the eye of a litigator and um, preparing to litigate. Um, trying to read too far beyond that may be doing your clients a disservice. I have litigated and tried and won at trial a case where I did not sit in on a day of testimony. I didn't touch the investigation. And on the flip side, I've been in testimony and taken testimony in a case that we ultimately did not charge. So I think um, trying to read too much beyond this is a litigator who's going to take um, the potential for taking this to trial seriously um, may not ultimately serve you well or your clients. There's the added benefit um, of having someone who's a little less passionate about the case and maybe a little more dispassionate provide an evaluative uh, just sense of the quality of the case. So whether they sit in on testimony of, of a key individual or cooperator, as Sarah said, I think having someone who's a little distance from the matter is not a bad thing. So I, I don't, I tell my clients I would not interpret it one way or the other and that I, I welcome having another point of view in the room, especially if it's someone who has to pick up the, the docket and, and run with it. Yeah, I guess it really comes down to who the trial attorneys are too. We, we all know most of the people in those functions and you know, some people are real bulldogs and you know, they're, they are hammers who go around the world seeing nails and some, some are take a slightly different approach. Now Matt, you were chief litigation counsel of course. You, many cases came across your desk. I'm gonna ask this question to you rather than Livia just because you know, you're among friends now and you can kind of <laughs> speak with more candor. Um, what effect, if any, when you evaluate a case, when you're part of the discussion about settlement position, charging decisions, you know, 10B or bust, or would maybe only be willing to settle to say uh, negligence-based uh, findings. Is it when you see that the defendant, potential defendant, has real trial counsel, not just litigators, but people who are ready, willing, and able to try the case, you know, they want to get to a jury. Does that affect, when you were at the SEC, did that affect the discussions at all? I, I think on the, mar on the margins it does, absolutely. Uh, because it's a, it's a calculus that you have to make. Um, you know, when you're running the unit, or if you're a supervisor, or really if you're a line attorney in the unit, you ought to be thinking this way. There's limited resources. You only have so many complaints you can file now only in federal court, because APs are no longer available, basically. So it's a big deal to, to bring a litigated case, and it takes resources, and to do it right against sophisticated counsel, um, you know, you're going to really have to have your A game, and I think the SEC has that capability now, for sure, and it, and it brings its A game. but. Um, but it has to be judicious. So uh, certainly when I was chief litigation counsel, I think the same was true for my predecessor, and it's probably true for Olivia. Um, it can have an impact. And, and, and the impact isn't just, oh, I don't want to go to trial against this person. The impact is, this is a worthy adversary. They know how to marshal the arguments. They're going to file a motion to dismiss that may have some chance of success. And if we get into discovery, we're going to have a dogfight in our hands, and it's going to be a significant resource drain. Um, it's, it's one of many variables that I would absolutely think about. And I, I can, as I think back uh, over my experience as chief litigation counsel, I was thinking about this this morning. 
one of your partners, I think, Bill McGuire. Uh -huh. I remember, and George Canellis was in the room for this. He came in and did a presentation. It was a 102E case. A charming Irish accent. He yeah. was, this guy knew the facts absolutely cold, very matter of fact, not pounding the table, and explained to us in a very dispassionate way what he was going to do <laughs> to us in the litigation. Who his witnesses with, were. With that warm smile that you guy could have been a movie star and you I've never interacted with him since, yeah. but I, I, I recall that. I don't know whether George recalls this meeting, maybe we'll talk about it after this, but you know, that kind of presentation from a lawyer who has just absorbed all of the facts, has thought through the arguments, has thought through how we would have to try the case, how he would try the case, or she would try the case, and can explain that. Again, not pounding the table, but just this is what's coming. This is what we're going to do. Uh, we can do this, but we shouldn't have to do this because it's a civil matter, and one of us is miscalculating if this goes on to a complaint and trial. We think you are, and, and, and here's why. Th that has an impact, I think. What has less of an impact, obviously, is the brow beating and the threats, and right. we're going to kick your butt. You know, obviously, nobody's going to pay attention to that, no matter who the other side is. Well, well I like your answer, in all seriousness, because for marketing, I always tell clients, if you hire us, you know, it will really get us to you know, a better position because they're, they're not going to want to try the case. Um, the good thing, we didn't really prepare this uh, presentation, as you probably maybe are discovering, other than kind of throwing out general topics. So uh, I'm learning the answers at the same time. So we're, uh, we're in litigation. This is a case where, you know, there's, it, there's, it's going to go to trial. We, just, we know um, it's that kind of case. So the playbook for you know, AM Law 100 firms is typically boil the ocean and file every motion and discovery and motion to dismiss. Um, when, the, let's say, Claudius, do you ever give thought, uh, I do in certain cases, to let's do the opposite. Let's, let's, let's push the throttle forward. Let's get the earliest trial that we can. Hold, hold them to their proof. We know the staff does not have a strong case. I think the answer is uh, to steal Sarah's playbook. It depends. You know, if you've, if you've been counsel during the investigative phase and you've had the opportunities to get the benefit of what the staff has uncovered in their investigative process, maybe you've had robust reverse proffers, um, you've uh, narrowed down the issues in terms of what you, know, what you have to try uh, successfully to win, and you have things like your, line, your experts lined up um, you think you have a pretty good handle about the witnesses you're going to present, what they're going to say, and a pretty good handle of what the government's going to present, you know, just as importantly. And, and you have a sense of the credibility of those witnesses, um, that the discovery process you're not going to be all that dependent on because of some of the preliminary work you've done, then yeah, you could press ahead. And if you're in the AP world, you're not going to have much of a choice anyways. I know they could set a very um, tight hearing schedule and you'll have to live with that in terms of getting um, your discovery prepared, your audit, your, if it's an audit case, um, or evaluation expert prepared. And so there's, there's opportunity for that. And I'm not always sure that the staff, you know, as much as they want to say they're ready, they're, they're really ready in the, in the true sense. But there's a lot of risk in, involved in that. And um, you know, one of the things you have to think about is if there's case law that's bubbling up through the federal courts that may be favorable to you, you know, you don't want that case law uh, to be missed in your process, and you want to apply that case law. I remember we filed a, a 2E back in the days when it was a 2E, not 102E when I was on the staff, and Central Bank of Denver came down. And I'm pretty convinced that opposing counsel delayed their negotiations and, and delayed actually saying that they were going to litigate with us because they knew that case was coming down. Um, and it certainly affected the strength of our overall case. So I think there's things you have to keep in balance when you're thinking about whether to, to put the government to its proof sooner rather than later. Right, oftentimes you have the circumstances where the trial counsel don't know any more about the case than the defense counsel because they're new to it as well. I mean, I generally think that moving your case aggressively as defense counsel is advantageous because of the resource concerns on the SEC side, but I wouldn't leave anything on the table. I, th I think, you know, you should move to dismiss you should do full discovery. You should take discovery of witnesses that the SEC may not have taken testimony from. Think broadly about the evidentiary record. Force the SEC to produce documents that are not exclusively located in the investigative file so that the discovery burdens run both directions. 
do a robust summary judgment motion and then full motions in limine, then to trial. I wouldn't want to leave any of that on the table, um, but I do think there can be significant advantages to essentially putting the staff back on their skis by moving that very, very quickly, which you know, certain judges are more than happy to give you a, an eight-month trial date. And you get through those phases fast, and then you get to trying the case in front of a jury. I'll just, I'll just respond as far as boil the ocean versus you know push things. You know, we, we may not have the resources to boil the ocean in every case, but I think just in, 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 in some ways, in some ways, you know, it's it's an advantage. Like I said before, we put our resources where it makes sense, and that means that um, if you don't aren't able to boil the ocean at every instant in every case, you're preparing for trial um, from the beginning of litigation and and before when you're running an investigation. And that means that you can really focus on the things that matter, whether in motion practice or discovery. Um, you know, the other side may be trying to boil the ocean, um, but it can be a, an advantage to stay focused on what you're going to need to prove and making sure you can get there in the most efficient way. So, uh, you know, we, we are uh, armed with an investigation when we file. I think our trial counsel um, are generally up to speed uh, by that time, if not well before, and uh, we then litigate with an eye to being ready to actually try the case. That is what our trial attorneys want to do. Yeah, I'll just make the observation that my experience in the government, when the case gets bigger because the opposing parties is doing more and they're, they're requiring more, and there's more motions, and it creates the effect of then just drawing more government resources into that. And oftentimes you end up getting the better lawyers from the government side are then put on the case because they realize this is a case that is maybe going to have more of a life to it. Now, um, Sarah mentioned Olivia's resources a moment ago. With all these cases litigating, everything going to trials, uh, should people in this room assume that your office is not going to be stretched thin and it's going to have a harder time going forward? I wouldn't assume that. Um, we're busy. Our trial lawyers are busy. Uh, we have had, obviously, more litigation. Um, uh, over the last period of time, um, as all the speakers and panels have alluded to today. I would not assume that we are um, stretched thin or not going to be able to handle these cases. Um, we're going to put the resources where they're, they're needed. We're going to staff cases leanly where it makes sense and where we can be effective um, and where we need to put a lot of people, put a lot of resources, um, make sure we have our experts in place we're going to put the resources there as well. So I would not, I would not assume that. Yeah. I would say it was a half serious question in that it does seem that uh, based upon the numbers that maybe more is going to be required of uh, your, your team than during equivalent periods in years, uh, years past. I mean, we, there are ebbs and flows. Certainly we're at a more active period. There have been ebbs and flows since, you know, I'm sure much longer than I've been at the commission. Um, we, I personally have been doing a lot of hiring, um, and uh, that's taking place across the commission. Um, and so I, I think that we're going to have the resources in place um, for all these cases we're bringing. Olivia, are you finding that you have to leverage investigative staff to staff litigation? Is that something you're doing more of than in the past? I don't know that it's something we're doing more of because of this issue. I mean, I think it's something that has been a trend in our litigation since before I joined. Um, I've, in the trials that I've had and the litigations that I've had, always had investigative staff really pretty actively involved. There are investigative staff who want to be doing that, um, either as part of their own training um, or just as part of their experience in the division. So it's happening. I don't know that it is a change due to um, constraints. It's just happening as part of how we conduct our litigation. I mean, it just wouldn't make sense any other way, given the depth of knowledge our staff have. Yeah, I mean, Olivia, I don't know what the stats are now. I remember when I was Chief Litigation Counsel, the class of cases where we lost the most was insider trading, and we lost nearly half of those cases. And we won almost everything else, at least some claim in every other kind of case. And to me, that's an indication that and, and this goes to the win-loss record, and I kept wins and losses the exact same way. Nothing's wrong with that, a win's a win. Um, but when it's insider trading, it's fraud or it's not fraud, unless it's a tender offer, in which case you got negligence. But it's fraud or it's not fraud. That's a good place to be. 
for a defense lawyer in a civil case because you're, you're, you're essentially having to embrace a criminal standard if you're the, if you're the SEC, you know, intentionality, recklessness, okay? In other cases, um, you know, it is a tough calculus. Um, I think companies and individuals should fight more. They need to fight more. The law needs to be made by judges, not by speeches, um, not by, uh, you know, papers, um, not by settlements. Um, it needs to be made by, by, by Article III judges and appellate courts um, uh, as well, and the Supreme Court. But um, the SEC's got a lot of weapons in its quiver when it brings charges, because as folks in here know, there's strict liability, there's um, reasonableness when you're talking controls, there's negligence, there's recklessness, and there's intentionality. Whereas in a criminal case, it's just you know, willfulness. You, know, you don't have negligence in a, in, a, in a criminal case. So it's a really exacting calculus, back to your first question, but if you think you're in a situation where essentially the SEC has to prove fraud of some stripe, I think it's a good bet to take a shot mm -hmm. and the company can, can, can withstand the complaint um, because I think then, again, the trial turns into something. Now we're sort of getting into how you actually can potentially win one of these things if you, if you, if you bring it. If you can make the decision for the judges and the jury as basically fraud versus not fraud or right versus wrong as opposed to really you know, knifing it out over, you know, um, mens rea and these technical type violations, which I think are tougher to bring in federal court, tougher for juries to get invested in. You know, I think you're going to begin to see some losses pile up in cases like yeah. that. But 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 it's tough because you got to run the table on these charges, and juries often want to split split the baby in these types of cases. So something's got to be thought through very carefully when you're making a decision of whether you're going to, you know, go ahead and do the complaint litigation route or or, or try to cut your losses before you get to court. Yeah, I would say if the staff is losing 50% of its insider trading cases, you should perhaps reevaluate which cases it, it charges. Well, but, but with insider trading case, the really good ones go to the criminal authorities. Um, the, the pretty good ones settle, and it's the dogs, typically. And you had one of these, which was not a dog. It was not a you dog. Had a, you had a judge pull the rug out from under you. So that, I will that's not a different comment. situation. <laughs> different cases situation. On <laughs> but these are, these are the cases that try are the ones where the defendants are going to have a shot. They're the, they're the ones that, that, that weren't referred or, or couldn't settle. And so I, I would love to see more folks in this room really test the SEC and put mm -hmm. them in a proof on this. And it'd be a good thing for the SEC. It'd be a good thing for the uh, defense bar and the development of the law generally. Well, it seems this year is the year to put the SEC to its proofs uh, based upon some of the resource issues. Now you well, and, and I asked Olivia about the win-loss stat, not to beat up on Olivia, who's a good friend of mine, but instead because I think it's important to advising your clients for precisely the reason that Matt says, is that for some clients, a win on cyanter-based fraud is enough of a win. For some clients, a win on we get it down to internal controls, we get it down to books and records would be enough of a win. And those are triable cases if you've got a client for the appetite for it because you may very well, despite the heavily skewed matrix of SEC success at trial, you may be able to pull out something that puts your client in a much better position than a settlement would. Now, you have all worked on many complex matters and oftentimes it's not just an SEC case. There's an SEC case, there's a DOJ, DOJ proceeding, there's shareholder litigation. Uh, there could be derivative claims in Delaware. There can be foreign authorities conducting their own processes. Uh, Claudius, when you have these, this kind of swirl of all these overlapping, ongoing parallel matters, how do you use these other proceedings, if at all, to benefit your position in the SEC case or conversely use the SEC case to perhaps put yourself in a better put your client in a better position in some of the other proceedings. So let's start with the scenario where there's a parallel, parallel DOJ and SEC cases, because I think, as many people in this room know, that that scenario is becoming more and more common for a variety of reasons that we discussed earlier. That could today. be its own panel. <laughs> yeah, and um, so you're, you're in a position where you're facing a DOJ and maybe an SEC case, DOJ goes first, and you're trying to level the playing field because the government has had a lot of time to gather evidence from a lot of different sources, talk to a lot of people, obtain a lot of documents. And you're trying to figure out if you're facing the DOJ case, what is it that the SEC has that DOJ does not have in its files? And so the thing you think about is can you, um, can you assert that DOJ and SEC were conducting a joint investigation? 
And you know, the case law, and Olivia, I'm sure is gonna have views on this, the case law is a little bit all over the place. It really depends on the facts. But, and a lot of the case laws come out of the Southern District for obvious reasons, because the Southern District has, has numerous parallel cases with the SEC. But the, to the extent that the SEC and DOJ case is more intertwined, you know, I would say the more often that, that joint interviews are conducted or interviews are conducted together, um, prosecutorial strategy is discussed and figured out. Um, you know, you could have a case where DOJ is reviewing the SEC um, subpoenas and search terms and things like that, which, which occurred in one case. Um, you have an opportunity to level a playing field and, and to get to Brady material that may be in one agency's files and not in the other agency's files. And the courts typically will have both agencies make a submission on that, so you won't necessarily get discovery on that. But it's an opportunity to flush out a little bit more about what the government has that could be helpful to you. And it could be exculpatory information, it could be impeachment um, information, but it gives you an opportunity to defend yourself more effectively. And it really depends on the facts about how far you can go with that. But given that given that at least DOJ has its Brady obligation, the SEC and APs has a version of Brady as an obligation, I think you have to think about how to take advantage of those scenarios where you may have something closer to a joint investigation. I also will say, I think DOJ and the SEC have gotten savvier on this. I think you see fewer situations where DOJ will allow the SEC to take notes of a witness interview. Um, they won't get 302s, the SEC won't. They maybe will get to review them, maybe take some summary notes of them. Well, they'll, they'll use portals where they'll show the yeah, or they'll as show if them. that makes yeah. a difference. Yeah, yeah. But, but the idea, idea is that the SEC is not leaving a documentary trail about and doesn't have the documents themselves, which I think you know, gives them a little bit of an advantage in terms of prevailing on some of these uh, claims of a joint investigation. But you have other situations where um, strategy is being closely coordinated. It's not just issuing simultaneous press releases and, and cases, but there's much closer coordination, and then it really depends on how far the court's gonna let you go in terms of running that down. Yeah, I mean, obviously the SEC or other agencies can be considered part of the prosecution team within the discovery obligations of the Justice Department under the criminal standards, and uh, seem to be giving a lot of commentary on the side. I, I think the courts need to catch up with the reality on the ground and um, take a, a sharper look at you know, when the SEC's involvement is so um, extensive that it really does trigger Brady obligations over the SEC's files as well. I'll just echo that the case law is mixed um, and that all of our investigations are, of course, parallel. I'll just say that. But uh, no, the case law is mixed. And um, just recently in the Southern District within this, the last year, you know, I think Judge Cote looked at a number of factors. It ends up being facts and circumstances. Um, but the fact that some activities are conducted together, like interviews, um, does not mean, and generally has not meant, that the court is automatically going to find a joint investigation. Um, and by the way, I mean, if several discovery is not stayed and you've got, you know, two litigations going on, um, you're going to get fulsome discovery of the SEC's files in the civil case through your document requests. So yeah, You might be convicted by the time you get that discovery. <laughs> if you're but, not stayed, if you're not stayed, right. yes. There is that issue. The law of, of stays, which I've, uh, many of us argue many times, seems to be the government gets what it wants under the <laughs> controlling circumstances of, of the case. I, I, there are situations where we have not been stayed. We're acutely aware of those, and it, you know, um, I think there are pros and cons for both sides yeah. when there's not a stay. I, I was going to say, put an asterisk the next to cases before Judge Rakoff on, on the stay. So, um, Claudius, uh, you know, one of the central kind of defenses in a lot of cases is reliance, reliance on professionals. You know, something we're all very familiar with. Um, if you have a case where you seem think there really is a strong reliance-based uh, defense, how do you? Uh, Develop that throughout the whole process. So, if you're if you're litigating, you have to think carefully about what to assert as a, an affirmative defense and what form of reliance you're going to be asserting. Um, in most cases, I think the SEC is going to have a pretty good idea by the time they initiate litigation as to what types of reliance arguments you're going to have. You you probably fronted some of those questions uh, on reliance and positions on reliance during the the Wells process. And it won't, be a, it won't be a secret in that sense. And I think aside from having to, 
to put something in your answer to preserve arguments, you, I, I think the question is how much discovery do you actually have to use to develop that? Are there friendly third parties, you know, people who work for the same company, for example, that you relied upon, outside consultants, outside lawyers, in-house lawyers, where you don't need to flush that out in the discovery process, but you can certainly put your arguments together in preparation for trial. So I think there are opportunities there. I think the other thing to think about is there, there are variants of, on the theme of reliance on, on for example, counsel. Uh, reliance on the advice of counsel is a very difficult event to put forward for a lot of reasons. It's very tricky. First of all, whose privilege is involved and can you even get to the privilege information? Because if it's not your privilege information, there's a good chance you can't get to it. And then just meeting the elements um, is, is challenging. Some defendants in SEC cases have had success on, on a variant of that, sort of the um, involvement of counsel, the fact that counsel was involved, whether it was just in-house counsel or outside counsel. I think the SEC has tried um, to, 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 to some success, but to limited success, to try to argue that defendants are using a veiled version of reliance on, on counsel. But there have been cases um, like Howard v. SEC, which the DC Circuit found in favor of Howard. There's the Terrell case where he successfully at least was able to put forward his affirmative defense. And then there's non-lawyer defenses. So there's, West, there's Westport Capital, where they were allowed to put forth a defense on non-lawyers um, consulting on, on a form ADV question. So I think there's opportunities to build that argument. And then if you're representing an auditor, and they had the benefit of consultations outside the audit team. They have an engagement quality reviewer who usually is a partner who weighed in on many of the critical issues. You have the benefit of, of that complex of, of reliance that you can put forth as well. And the SEC doesn't necessarily reach those people in the investigative process. So, so, so there's an opportunity to bring afresh some of those arguments um, in, in terms of litigating. You know, Olivia, uh, it's not just Matt who's among friends, so are you. And it seems to make sense that since this is a, a panel on the winning playbook, um, what things in all seriousness do you see from defense lawyers or uh, the things that become not you know, troublesome, but things that uh, counsel do uh, in cases against your office you find are effective? So I would say in the courtroom, whether it's before a judge or ultimately a jury, um, it's the same thing that matters the most, I think, for our success, which is having a compelling story about why something matters, why the case matters, um, why someone did something, and why the fact finder is sitting there. You know, we focus, and in our litigations, I like to think we have a compelling story to tell. Um, on all of those things, um, but on the flip side, when um, when you and the defense bar and and before charging can can tell a compelling story that is backed up by facts, that raises a question about why would somebody do this? You know what was in it for them, or um, why does this matter? I, I think those things um, can be effective ultimately if something goes to trial. Yeah, I, I always thought in a fraud case, if you can show the fact finder, show the judge or jury that he's a good guy, there's no self-interest, there's no self-dealing, it goes a long way. So Matt, you know, you, you were in the, the same seat Olivia is now, we're getting in uh, 60 seconds or less. <laughs> what kind of things did you find that you thought were? Uh, credibility, it's just credibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think. Of, of the defendant or, or the lawyers? Well, I think if defense lawyers can put themselves in a position during the discovery process, during the trial process, or in front of the jury, where they seem like the serious actors, the adults, the ones who are being dispassionate, I think that puts you in very, very good standing. I think that, again, what I open with, it, the, the histrionics, the table pounding, the not being judicious about the arguments you make as defense counsel, I'm not one of those lawyers mm -hmm. that makes every argument I can. I just won't do it. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, yeah. but, 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 but a lot of lawyers, I think, do do that and fall into that trap. And the SEC is going to have a little bit of a thumb on the scale. The SEC will have a little bit of a thumb on the scale in any event as a government entity, whether we like it or not. So I think it's paramount for defense counsel. And obviously, the defendant's going to be testifying in a civil case, credibility, and um, you know, coming across as somebody who is unafraid to tell their side of events and and uh, you know speak with conviction. That's your that's your best shot in one of these cases. Right. So it sort of goes back to that.
foil the ocean approach can have uh, negative effects on, on the credibility and the success of the final outcome. Bruce? Yeah, thank you. Terrific.